Hello and welcome to another Digital Leader Salon with me, Simon Valfish. And me, Edward Rushton. Every week, Edward and I get together to discuss in detail uh, one song or a few songs that we've recorded. And uh, we're doing this to celebrate our 10th year of working together as a leader partnership. And we'd also very much value your uh, input. We invite you to get in touch with us by using the hashtag Digital Leader Salon to request us to talk about a song that you particularly like that we have recorded. So you just have to go on Spotify or look on um, iTunes or whatever and find out what we've done, listen to something you like, get in touch with us and we'll have a chat about it in a future episode. You can support this. We really need the support right now. So please click on the PayPal link below or if you do not uh, have the means to support us financially then you can share the video and tell all your friends about us we like that too and please get in touch because we love to hear from you and we like to know that we're not the only ones in this world who are interested in this kind of thing although we know it is a niche business Edward uh, hello uh, <laughs> how are things in Switzerland um, quite normal actually it's normal um, in terms so. of uh, pre-COVID normal or in terms of the new normal? Well, I, I kind of, I've kind of lost track of it, to be honest, because everything seems to be so normal. I mean, it's still, it's still not like, there's still very few concerts happening, but they're starting to happen again. Um, and what else can I say? Um, there, is I, things seem very normal. People are just behaving normally again. This is you know hugging and um, all that stuff. Hugging? We hug. You get we, we are doing hugging. We, we are, we're, yes, hugging is going on. Hugging is happening. There is some. In there is some, some. So if you want to hug, go down Switzerland. Yeah. That's where to be. <laughs> if you're missing your hugs, I'm missing my hugs. I had a meeting yesterday with some friends in the park, and we did foot tapping. Yeah. Which is strange, yeah, yeah. strangely erotic, but mostly just strange. Anyway, um, speaking of strangely erotic, uh, what are we going to be talking about today? Which amazing piece of music have we discovered today and why? Yes, well, it's, a, it's a, an amazing piece, you're right. It's um, a song cycle by Robin Holloway, the British composer Robin Holloway. A song cycle or a, a piece, really, a big piece, a 17 minute, I don't know, you could even call it a cantata, I suppose, because there are some... Or a sort of vocal rhapsody, vo Yeah, vocal rhapsody sounds a good, very good term for it. Um, and it's for baritone and piano. Um, and it is a sort of a cycle because it consists of nine separate poems um, taken from a cyclic poem by Geoffrey Hill. Uh, a British poet who died in 2016. What else? Yes, it's the, the name of the song, the name of the cycle, the name of the piece is The Lover's Well, which is also the name of Geoffrey Hill's poem, which was taken from a collection he wrote in 1978 called Tenebrae, Darkness. And the, the content of the, of the book, Tenebrae, as well as of, of this cycle, The Lover's Well, is slightly religious, um, and slightly erotic because it's it's another it's another sort of Catholic thing I think there's a lot of pain, a lot of blood, and uh, but also a lot of transcendence. So there's darkness and light in it, um, and the setting is a sort of mysterious, non-specific, medieval Spain. Um, so there are definitely shades of Parsifal which is presumably one reason why Robin was attracted to this cycle. Um, anyway, to cut a long story short, we recorded this piece a couple of years ago um, for a disc produced by the label Delphian, which was a compilation of several pieces, vocal and piano works by Robin Holloway, to celebrate his 75th birthday. And um, I think it's quite a beautiful disc actually there's lots of lots of great pieces on it including a massive uh, uh a piece for piano duet a sort of waltz fantasy uh, on themes from parsifal by robin called souvenir de Montsalvat, and 
uh, some other songs, cycles, also some pieces for vocal quartet and piano. And this was requested by uh, Luke Fitzgerald, uh, and anybody can contact us using the hashtag Digital Leader Salon and request us to have a chat about one of the songs or a song cycle even that we've recorded. And we were really pleased that uh, Luke got in touch with us um, with this epic work that we're about to discuss now. So, Edward, you actually studied with Robin Holloway, is that right? Yeah. You studied composition with him. That's right, yes. Uh, Robin was my, my teacher, my, my composition teacher at Cambridge. Um, but actually, I've known him for a lot longer than that because um, Robin was my composition teacher at Cambridge. Uh, composition is a small part of the of the studies. What do you call it? When you if you if you study if you read music at the University of Cambridge, then you might be allowed to do a bit of composing as well. Anyway, so I opted for that, and Robin was my teacher. Um, but I've actually known him for a lot longer than that because he is a close friend of my father's. Uh, they go back a long way. Who is the musicologist and writer Julian Rushton. Exactly. And Robin, I believe, I wasn't around at the time, but um, I'm reliably informed, was actually, in fact, best man at my parents' wedding. So there's a... <laughs> There's a sort of family connection there as well. And in fact, I remember going to see Robin when I was a kid. My dad took me to see his friend Robin in his incredible rooms uh, in Cambridge in a, in a, in a very wacky uh, Jugendstil Art Nouveau villa in a park where he still lives. And I was incredibly impressed with this, this, these rooms. Uh, he presumably still has music, records, CDs, stuff all over the place, piles of music all over the, you know, on the floor, uh, shelves bulging, two massive pianos covered in music, just music everywhere, books. Um, and this was kind of, I think, for me, this is sort of a vision of paradise when I was a kid. <laughs> so just an incredible, a beautiful room overflowing with the paraphernalia of music. You know, I, I, I couldn't imagine a more, more beautiful place to be. So uh, I, I try and kind of live up to that ideal somehow. I've <laughs> yeah, I've seen your music. <laughs> I'm just looking around mine because we're trying to pack up to move and I'm regretting having so much stuff. But there you ah, go. Well, you have to have a lot of stuff. It's all, go it's all going on an iPad now. Oh really? You're going to do that? Oh. Yeah, I'm going to go. I'm going to down the iPad That's route. That's sad. Be a bit more mobile. Well, I'm still going to keep the music. It's just yeah. I'm not going to take four boxes of music. I'm going to take one iPad. Okay. Don't, I'm not. So modern. Music, what the hell? I know. Quite shocked actually. Anyway, shall we carry on talking anyway. about Robin Holloway? Um, yes, so you talked about Robin Holloway's rooms, I've talked about his and rooms, he's, yeah. the, he's been the best man. Now, tell me, so for those of you who don't know, Edward Rushton is an amazing composer, and this is uh, no little thanks to his teacher, Robin Holloway, who we're talking about just now, in case you'd forgotten what we were talking about. And <laughs> um, Edward, why don't you give us a little bit of insight into, well, what you understand or what you... you like about Robin Holloway's compositional techniques perhaps or his colours and how that's influenced you as a composer and what is it like to then play his music with you do you play it with your pianist hat on or your composer hat on or do you not have hats like that <laughs> that's a very interesting question is it was a series There's of very interesting questions, questions. In there. um let me think yeah Robin as I said, I've known him for a long time, and uh, he's a sort of, through his association with my father, a kind of father figure as well. So I've always looked up to him and to his rooms and to his piles of music on the floor. And, um, but above all, to his enthusiasm and love for late romantic music. Not only, and not, he's not exclusively interested in late romantic music, but he kind of breathes it, he kind of exudes Wagner and Debussy, about whom he wrote a famous book called either Wagner and Debussy or Debussy and Wagner. 
um, which goes into something that wasn't actually very, very well, that hadn't been examined so much at the time, which was Wagner's influence on Debussy, because Debussy, of course, was very keen to push Wagner's influence away from him and claim that, you know, he, he was a revolution, revolutionary and, and, um, and Wagner was old hat. But of course, there is so much Wagner in Debussy's music. And um, all these, all this sort of, this, this, um, Robin's concerns with that music, the music of that period, Schumann, Wagner, Debussy, um, his love for Strauss, Mahler, Stravinsky, these are, the, the, you can tell with Robin, it's about music. You know, he's, he's sort of, he's absorbed so much music and it's all in there. Of course, his style is very individual as well, even if he uses sometimes, uh, he, he, he's one of those composers who likes to quote other composers, composers he reveres. So sometimes you have uh, little snippets of, um, of Wagner or Sibelius or... Um, what else is there? Well, yeah, it's Stravinsky. There, there was a, there was, um, what can I say? Yeah. He's a composer who likes to, who often quotes other composers in his music. So if you listen to some of the orchestral pieces, for example, um, you can, you can hear a lot of quotations from Sibelius or, um, Stravinsky, uh, Wagner as well, of course. And, and so this is all part of, Robin, it's such an in integral part of him that you can't really separate um, that the the sources that he taps into the whole the whole uh, kind of the history of music the um, the kind of the mass of music that has been written is kind of in him and comes out in a very natural way in his music and you can't tell where the seams are mostly. Uh, even with the quotations that he uses. Not in this piece that we're talking about today, actually. But if you hear some of Robin's pieces that use quotation, um, it's done in ex an extremely natural, organic way. The, 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 the quotations slip in and out, and it's still all very much Robin. Mostly the mm. quotations come in as a sort of game, a musical game that he plays with, with himself and with the audience. Um... Let me give you an example. One of the pieces, yeah, because since you asked me what I find fascinating about Robin's music, one of the pieces I got to know best um, as a student was the second concerto for orchestra, which came out on a really great uh, CD on the NMC label. I imagine it's still available. I can only recommend it because it's an absolutely amazing piece. Second concerto for orchestra. And there's a, there's a, a sort of massive, one of the massive climaxes amongst the thousands of massive climaxes in these pieces, um, quotes, O sole mio. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, yeah. And then there's a, the, the, he followed that up with a third concerto for orchestra. And I, I, I would say, as a, speaking as a composer and um, um, a disciple of Robin, the third concerto for orchestra is probably the piece that... Um, influenced me most. It's incredibly dense. Uh, it's it's long. It's heavy. It's it's <coughs> overloaded with just gorgeous jungle-like sounds, um, using an enormous orchestra in, 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 in an incredibly colourful way. Um, it's fascinating. It draws you in. It sucks you in like um, the tendrils of a, an exotic jungle plant, and and you get you just get stuck in there and. Um, breathe the, the you know the um, heavy laden the scented air of his music it's absolutely wonderful uh, so yeah um, there's also something of that I think in the the love as well the piece that we've recorded uh, the the dark sounds the the sort of you know the, the I'm struggling a bit because if any of you know Robin you know what a genius he is for adjectives he just has an incredibly um colorful vocabulary so <laughs> it seems like a bit of um um it's a hard task to try and describe Robin's music in any way that uh, he couldn't do 
so much better himself. But the darkness, the the the, the browns, the you know the sort of earthy, mouldy greens and browns that you get, uh, that of course contrasts with them, um, with sort of skittering, scurrying, bright, E major, uh, piccolos, and you know this it's all there. Um, Hmm. And it's all there in this piece. So we said at the beginning that it's it's um, a religious. Mo- there are religious motifs. Uh, it's it's a um, you can't really say what it's about, but you can see hmm. there are there are certain themes that you you feel are extremely uh, um, important. The pain of of having a, being wounded. It's a, a knight has been killed on a road um, in the, in Spain in the Middle Ages. Um, so there's all this blood and pain and tritones and anguish dissonances, but there is this transcendence. There's a sort of sense of love is there to, uh, as in Wagner, to um, lift us all out of this of this pain of the world of pain and um, and show us a better a better place a place where we have been um, redeemed through love or through religion. Okay, why don't you read some of the poem? The first poem is goes like this. They slew by night upon the road Medina's pride, Olmedo's flower. Shadows warned him not to go along that road. Weep for your lord, Medina's pride, Olmedo's flower, there in the road. And in this uh, setting, it's only two pages of music. We don't have anything to do together yet. He introduces the voice and the piano separately, uh, except for some over- overhanging chords held by the pedal. Is that right, Edward? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Laissez vibrer, he's written here. So he gives you a lovely fa- sort of a fantasy like free improvisando con rapsodia, he's written yeah. for your... Um, do you want to give us a little play of that and then maybe I'll sing the first line? Yeah, so um, if you listen carefully, you can hear two of the, the main tonalities already in the first line, which is a, f- a free improvisation just by, uh, by the piano. Uh, the E, and uh, within that E tonality, there's also a very prominent B flat or A sharp, which will come back later. I mean, if you know anything about music, you'll know that E and A sharp are what's called a tritone apart, which is a sort of painful, ugly kind of interval. Um, so you get a lot was of that this. known as the, as the devil's interval, wasn't it, in That's right. Paganini's uh, time? Yeah, they used to or call it the, some... the music, music's devil. M- music's devil, yes. Uh, so you can hear that, and that will be structurally important later on in the cycle. So it starts like this. You can also hear the sort of medieval knightly sort of music, these sort of fanfares, very sort of diffuse, muted fanfares. Because it's a sort of horn sounds. Mm. That's an important part of it as well to set the scene of, of um, uh, kind of dark things happening, people getting killed for whatever reason. We don't know. For love, possibly. Um, in back in the Middle Ages, why didn't you? Yeah, you give us some of the the recit as well. They slew by night upon the road, Medina's pride. the fifth motif again and then our tritone has come back with these gorgeous major thirds in the right hand of the piano so 
that, that, that's, a, what, that's a motif that's going to be very important um, in the piece. There's a, a long piano interlude in the middle and the postlude as well. And this is the driving force, this motif, these fifths and this uh, sort of these, these uh, pained but very rich uh, falling third motif um, is, is what happens there. The second poem goes like this. Down in the orchard I met my death, under the briar rose I lie slain. I was going to gather flowers, my love waited among the trees. Down in the orchard I met my death, under the briar rose I lie slain. This is from the perspective of the already deceased, isn't it? Well. I can only imagine or, it is, yes. But you, fe you know, you can. <laughs> Who else could have you written can, that? You can. You get the feeling that that someone's been on the way to meet a lover, and has been killed while on the way there, so that, as a punishment. Um, but already the the rose, the blood, the thorns. There's a there's a there's a theme coming in here that 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 may lead to possible redemption later. Um, but and this is the first time. The voice and the piano are together now, isn't That's it? That's right, and it's the f also we, we've had this very dark music, um, but now we get a, the the what you might call a sort of love music, um, the, the 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 bare fifth fifths on E and B get filled in by the major triad. Down in the orchard has this E major based um, lyrical music, which changes immediately for I met my death. Uh, becomes darker again. It sounds like this. So the, 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 if you, <laughs> I kind of, I'm, I'm interested in these things. Uh, the, the, the notes that, that become other notes and mean something completely different. So we have, yeah, as I said, we have these, these fifths, the bare fifths of E and B, which get filled in by the G sharp to make E major. But but the, 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 the tritone the the B flat or the A sharp is still there that we have. So it's not just a simply beautiful love music all of a sudden, but that the darkness is within the light. And then what happens is it changes when the poet says I met my death. The G sharp from the E major becomes the dark minor third of F minor. So there's this sort of um, back and forth between dark, dark and light, major and minor, but all commingling. It's not a clear-cut thing. The, the minor notes merge into the major notes. Uh, the B flats merge into the E. It's all, part of, it's all part of the same kind of kaleidoscope of tonality and harmony. This um, second poem in the cycle ends... Uh, having gone through all this sort of m melange of minors and majors and darkness and light, love and death, um, it ends on a, a very wide open E, but without the major third again. So you have this, this um, progression that you think... Um, you think E has won the upper hand already, but it's, it's empty again. It's back to the bare fifths again. And it sounds something like this. I'm just only pointing these things out because it's when it's when um, um, some narrators say, "Listeners, listen, remember that because that will come back later. You know, this will be important later." So, <laughs> remember the E. Do you think that is E major at the end? But it's without the. I, it's without the. I almost heard a G sharp in there, but well, you, you didn't you play would one, did because you? of the overtones of the, of the bass note. You see, but it's not there. Right, song three. Uh, moving on, here we have uh, number three of The Lover's Well. You watchers on the wall, grown old with care. I too looked from the wall. I shall look no more. Tell us what you saw. The Lord I sought to serve, caught in the thorn grove his blood on his brow. You keepers of the wall, 
What friend or enemy sets free the cry of the bell? Yeah, so again, uh, it refers yeah. to the, the, the knight who, the, who has been killed, whether this is Jesus or who is also a lover in a metaphorical sense, the lover of, of humankind. Um, but and, there's and obviously it's... been a conspiracy against this knight who's been killed, who's been slain under the wall in the, in the rose bushes. Yeah, and so the, the, the music gets all sort of conspiratorial and, and um, film noirish. Uh, it's kind of sort of creeping around stealthily in the mm. shadows. Yeah, so that's the... This is definitely what you meant by the sort of the brown, dew, mildewy music that you mentioned Yes, exactly, earlier. yes. And he contrasts that and, with... And also something sort of... Tell us what you saw, the Lord I sought to serve. It, then the music gets very high, very completely opposite range of the piano. Yeah, this kind, these kind of sounds. And that, they, these, the dark and the, and the light music alternate until the cry of the bell, and it really explodes for the first time in the cycle. You get this very fierce sound of a, a D minor, but a dissonant D minor. Um... That's, that's D minor. Okay, so uh, this is great fun to play, of course. So Robin... Um, Absolutely wonderful to listen to as well. A... <laughs> He plays a mean piano as well, so you know he obviously loves writing for the piano. Um, and we talked about bells a couple of weeks ago, didn't we? In the we talked about Honega, bells in the Honega songs. Honega. Yeah, well, there's mm -hmm. some more. There's some more religious bells here, and then mm -hmm. we get another beautiful restative under this um, these tremoloing bells, and we we get a bird motif coming in for the first time. The next two poems use uh, very, very beautiful bird imagery. Simon, tell us, why don't you read the next two? Uh, yes, next two. Yeah. Here we go. Goldfinch and hawk and the grey aspen tree. I have run to the river. Mother, call me home. The leaves glint in the wind, turning their quiet song. The wings flash and are still. I sleep in the shade. When I cried out, you made no reply. Tonight, I shall pass by without a sound. And the next poem is, Slowly my heron flies, pierced by the blade, Mounting in slow pain, strikes the air with its cries, Goes seeking the high rocks where no man can climb, Where the wild balsam stirs by the little stream. The rocks, the high rocks, are brimming with flowers. There love grows, and there love rests and is saved. Yes, yeah, so the heron is, a, is a, I imagine, the sort of the, the, the spirit of the dead knight flying out of him in, in the form of a heron and, and escaping up to the high mountains where he will bleed and where flowers will grow, where love can rest and is saved. It's absolutely beautiful image and also where no man can reach yeah. you know somehow it's it's not tainted by the touch of a human That's right, yes. love can rest and love is saved because it's not, it's untouched by human hand yes yes it's absolutely so so the the, the conspirators the, the 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 people who wish one ill and are, are not part of the picture anymore it's just um a haven a haven where love can grow and in the piano part and in the vo voice part, you know, having had some quite complicated uh, rhythmical things to deal with, now he gives complete, almost complete freedom to the voice, you know, so you've got these tremolo chords and he's given me liberamente, yeah. not slow, folk song-like. And I can really just float around um, quite freely. Yes. That, exactly. which, gives, which is lovely to have so much freedom. Why don't you talk us through some of those, those markings that he's given? I love, for example, the, 
the 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 flash precision he's written some of the things with the, the sotto voce and then più cantabile the different kinds of slurs the different note values and all the time it's it's accompanied by these incredible um rustling but sort of deeply rustling um piano tremolo chords yeah he articulates the voice much like um you would expect to see on a string part um so you know i have um the leaves glint in the wind turning their quiet song but the best bit's coming up the wings flash and pass to i i remember having to ask Robin Holloway, in the when he was sitting there during our recording session, what does he want with fla? Uh, with, um, he, I've penciled in a crescendo, so obviously he wanted a crescendo. But do I crescendo on the shh or on the vowel? And to be honest, I can't remember what we decided on. So you'll have to listen to the CD to find out what was wished. I sleep in the shade, and then. This amazing with your with this. When I cried out, you made no reply. Again, all of these intervals. You made no reply. Tonight I shall pass by without a sound. And there's a love, there's this beautiful descent from all this, this these shimmering, shimmering uh, arpeggios. And it's quite the heron song starts. With, and then there's a, a, an, an amazing lyrical section where the heron flies up and up and up with this with a very stately motion it, it, it's not really bird music it's very very um slowed down to the high rocks up to the mountains yeah but it's a slow uh very um like flying through treacle somehow the the the, the dead night has a very um what does the heron look like i'm not my ornithology is not that great is it a big wide winged bird huge sort of... wings a very long neck long beak long legs it's a sort of long thin bird mm. Mm. um Beautiful. Yeah, and sort of so up it, up, it, up it goes very slowly, very, very, um, with great difficulty, <clears throat> um, wounded, being, it's been pierced, it's been pierced by the blade, mounting in slow pain, up, 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 up. Mm. And now at this point, um, we have to mention that Robin cut um, almost half of, of Geoffrey Hill's poems in order to set it. Um, basically, Robin just didn't, you know, there were some of the poems he just didn't like and thought they were too overtly religious. And we're allowed to say that because Robin's written about it himself in the in the CD booklet. Um, and it's, it's quite amusing what he writes, actually, because, um, in fact, we, we talked about this when we were working together. And he talked to Jeffrey Hill and said, look, I'm not going to set those ones. And there's still, after all these years, this, this song was written in 1981, but you could tell talking to Robin that there was still a lot of tension there. Um, and Robin describes in the note how Jeffrey Hill winced, had to had to sort of painfully agree to Robin's cuts, grudgingly 
let him set the shortened version of the cycle. But Robin himself, even when did we record this? 2017, something like that? 2018. Yeah. Was still wincing at the memory of, of these conversations <laughs> with his friend and the, the the great poet. I mean, you know, Geoffrey Hill is considered one of the great 20th century English poets. So you can't just sort of um, take it upon yourself lightly to tell him, I'm sorry, I don't like these poems. I'm not going to set them. I'm going to do my, I'm going to do it my way. Uh, so anyway, so that's an interesting little, um, little anecdote related to the composition. But Robin then decided instead to replace these missing poems with a long piano interlude, which he hoped mitigated to some extent the pain of, <laughs> of having just excised these um, presumably very important parts of the poem for Geoffrey Hill. So this is where we get the piano interlude, um, which is... Anyway, so that in the piano interlude, we get the, the, the music of the the, the... the fifths and the yearning, painful descending thirds but here not on E but on B flat but within this B flat tonality the E is, the, the, is still very present so what I was saying the darkness and the light are part of the same mixture um, anyway and it develops and it gets more and more passionate um, it's it's extremely um, emotionally charged music, very dense, uh, very driven towards the climax, um, which doesn't come immediately. It fails before it, it rises again and again. And the, the music is actually very, very dissonant, um, very mm. often very dissonant in a, in a harsh way. Um, and Do you want to play some of that? Yeah. So after this, this extremely pained, um, intense, emotional music. Wait, I'll start that a bit earlier. Um. Again. No one's practicing I'll, at the moment. I'll play that bit from the fifths again, okay? Okay, so this is harsh. He's even written hard. So, so if you find my playing rather ugly, uh, then you know that that's supposed to be the way it's played there. Uh, so you can hear the, the, the incredible range of um, colour in the harmonic language, the sort of range of emotion that is ingrained within the, um, the sound world here. Darkness, light, but the light is a very harsh light sometimes. And the darkness is also sometimes very um, inviting and alluring. And then um, towards the end of the, um, the piano interlude, the, the E major love music comes back. I, I know I'm going on about E major quite a lot, but it is very important for this piece, um, as you will find out when we talk about the end. Ah. So an interesting point, if you're a nerd like me, and you will, have, you will remember when we first heard that music, poem two, Down in the Orchard I Met My Death, it sounded like this. So, with the, the, the upper, uh, the, 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 the sharp fourth, the tritone. But here, that's gone, and it's just pure E major. Before the 
painful music times. practiced it so uh, it sounds a bit rough and ready but the the, the the big climax is is you can't get any brighter than, than C sharp major so we have this extreme build up of uh, winding up of tension and the, 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 the high point of it is this very before it dies away again So there's always this striving, I would say, the striving for love out of death, but it doesn't often work. Maybe at the end. Maybe at the end, like in Parsifal or Tristan on Isolde, there will be redemption. <laughs> we, will, we will see. Uh, and then it sort of alternates the heron song with the dark death, love death, death music. And now at the end of the of the piano interlude, the heron music is taking us somewhere else. And there's this really great scherzo which comes now in nine, nine eight time. Yes, um, fantastic. So now over to you, Simon, mm -hmm. to read us some more of the poetry. Works. Yes, so the poem for uh, poem number 11, after the piano interlude. If the night is dark and the way is short, why do you hold back, dearest heart? Though I, never, though I may never see you again, touch me, I will shiver at the unseen. The night is so dark, the way so short, why do you not break, oh, my heart? And I'll run on to the next one. Splendidly shining darkness, proud citadel of meekness, likening us our unlikeness, majesty of our distress. Emptiness ever thronging, untenable belonging, how long until this longing end in unending song? And soul for soul discover no strangeness to dissever, and lover keep with lover, a moment and forever. So, yeah, I'm quite excited about these, this part of the cycle because uh, these poems, these two poems depart from the um, religious theme and from the narrative of a, of a, a dead knight um, and somehow redemption emerging from blood. And they're rather more uh, to do with a, a, a general... Um, description of what it means to love. Uh, a carpe diem sort of song. If the night is dark and the way is short, why do you hold back? We must, we must love now. Why do you not break, oh my heart? So there's this very, very strong conflict within this poem um, between longing and uh, tragic reality. So that's very good material for a song. I think you'll agree, Simon. And then sp splendidly shining darkness. So that's kind of a motto for what we've been talking about, the light and the dark in the music that are part of the same thing. It's not a contrast of light and dark, but light within the dark and dark within the light. E within B flat, B flat within E. Uh, it's all part of the same mixture. And sometimes one aspect of it comes more to the fore, sometimes another aspect. Splendidly shining darkness. So these, these very strong um, powerful contradictions in the text. Proud citadel of meekness. <laughs> and you can hear, there's a sort of, there's, the, there's the, the, sh the shining castles, but they represent something very, very vulnerable. Um, and what's the other one that I liked so much? Emptiness ever thr thronging. Yeah, so, so f full emptiness. 
uh, belonging, longing, untenable. Yes, the impossibility of of uh, of coming together, of of redemption within lo within love. How long until this longing end in unending song? Okay, so Simon, you know me by now, and you know that this is <laughs> this is my theme. So we, we talked about these things with. Um, um, you know, these are the romantic poets who sublimate their strong emotional conflicts in song, in poetry. So the, the longing gets transformed through art, through song, into something much better, much even, even um, superhuman. The, 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 the dark human emotions through art get transformed into something divine. And I think that's what's happening here. Uh, how long until this longing end in unending song? So the end of longing, that is to say the end of pain, will be brought about through art, through song, through poetry, through music. So uh, I think that's a, it's, a, it's a nice part of the cycle that um, points to some, even for me, even wider, even bigger subject matter than than what the rest of the cycle is about uh, it's very much more general about uh, about humanity and being uh, what it is to be a, a musician and then the but to, and then at the but the end of the, the 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 last two poems move back to the world of the of the beginning of the dead night by the roadside um and the feelings of sadness, mournful feelings, feelings of loss at the lover having died. Mm. As he is wounded, I am hurt. He bleeds from pride, I from my heart. As he is dying, I shall live in grief, desiring still to grieve. As he is living, I shall die, sick of forgiving such honesty. I shall go down to the lover's well and wash this wound that will not heal. Beloved soul, what shall you see? Nothing at all, yet eye to eye. Depths of non-being, perhaps too clear. My desire dying as I desire. Yeah, again, these, it's great this, to this read them just like this. Sorry. Sorry. No, it's, it's, it's just extraordinary to revisit this at all and 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 to read them dry like this without even mm -hmm. the the music flooding you know in my sort of front consciousness yeah. and actually robin holloway sets i mean what what's missing in the poem that he puts in the music is after um i shall live in grief desiring still to grieve R robin holloway puts in he puts in a big emotional vocalise, um, which I won't sing now, but I'll play on the piano. Yes, and if, you can tell if a, if a it, composer does that. Sorry to interrupt. I, I know it's terrible. I shouldn't. You were in the middle of something. Tell me. Well, just uh, it, it's just amazing that he decided, right, here I need to put in a big, long, oh, really long sigh, emotion, yeah. point of emotion. Edward, what did you want to say? Yeah, about I wanted to say, if, if a, a composer breaks out for a moment from the poet's words that he or she is supposed to be setting and puts in a, a melisma like this on a, a nothing word, on just a vocalise, like you say, um, you can tell that that means an awful lot. There's something there that mm. the composer needs to say, something very, very personal that has to be expressed. And um, so what he's written, apart from the notes of the cadenza, this beautiful um, curving line up and down, uh, he's also written out um, detailed instructions as to what it means. So at first, he's written choked and sighing then opening out into warm expression, then tailing off and disappearing. Warm but not fruity. <laughs> Full of repressed anguish. So that's 
those are the instructions. That's, that's five, five instructions about how to sing that passage. Um, which Warm, is sent to but the, not to fruity, the full of arc. repressed anguish is probably the most favourite... <laughs> performance instruction i've ever i had remember during the recordings he said he was he was talking to you about how to do this and, and i've written in in pencil here utterly expressive so and this is something about robin's music i mean a lot of contemporary composers shun uh the idea that one can be utterly expressive in music um because they want their their concerns are other concerns but the concerns of a composer like robin holloway are this to be absolutely, utterly expressive of emotion um, and of human ideas within music. So you just have to pull out all the stops just as you would when you perform Schumann or Brahms, which we've talked about in previous episodes. Uh, it's just the same. To, to in, invest your whole emotional experience, life uh, and, and being into one musical phrase, and then it will come out what the composer wants. And it's what the composer wants and not what the poet wants at that point. Um, let's just talk about the end as, as, we, as we draw to the end of, our, of today's episode. Um, what I love about the, the way he sets the last poem is this contrast between the matter of fact and the richly sensual. I shall go down to the lover's well and wash this wound that will not heal. It set it extremely simply um, in a, with a sort of walking bass accompaniment. Um, Semplice, mezza voce, naive and almost casual, but it's inter interpolated with. with this soughing, sighing, uh, deeply felt falling motif uh, that we heard at the beginning of the cycle. Mm. Beloved soul, what you shall see, what shall you see? Nothing at all, yet eye to eye. It's again in this matter of fact matter-of-fact way and then again you have the <laughs> and then after the last line of the poem my desire dying as I desire which is again this in incredible mm. contradiction my, the desire is dying at the same moment as that I am still desiring the minor the major the pain the transcendence the, the yeah the blood and the light mm. And it's there in the music. So uh, why don't we just try singing? Um, My desire dying. Can we go from there? I'll play the bit before. My desire dying as I desire. The dark and the light alternating, the light within the dark, falling but E major falling, E major with the B, with the A sharp, B flat with the E in it, falling, 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 dying, dying, dying. But as you as your last line, as I desire, grows hmm. into the E major. So Robin sets the last, his last thoughts, his last feelings are of transcendence. After all this muddy So finally we get fantastic an, um, an almost unsullied E major which we've been striving for Finally. all the time. So, um, as we said at the beginning, there's uh, there's a lot of Wagner in this. It's it's uh, it's coming out there, just but not necessarily in the um, musical language, but in the idea that um, what we've been striving for for hours and hours, or in this case, seventeen minutes, is actually the, the promise is fulfilled at the end, um, mm. and so. As the heron flies up to the high mountains, even though he's been 
mortally wounded. So the music takes us up and up and up at the end, uh, even though we've suffered so much um, anguish during the during the piece. This is a good point, I think, to invite our listeners to click on the song itself. There is not that I could I couldn't find a YouTube video of this recording, which is unusual because normally something is automatically uploaded. But it's a good opportunity for you to go ahead and buy this CD. So it's available on Delphian Records and it's called The Love As Well, which is the name of this song cycle, but it's also the name of the CD, which involves a lot of fantastic other artists. I'll just give you, uh, read their names. We have the soprano Claire Lloyd Griffiths and Kate Simmons Joy, mezzo-soprano, along with the tenor James Robinson, and William Van is the other pianist on the disc, so there's some other ensemble pieces here, including another song cycle, which uh, Kate uh, Simmons Joy sings. And uh, yes, so go out, buy this CD, and possibly there's a link, if I can find one, to Spotify, uh, which I'll put in the description underneath this video, which uh, we invite you now to go and have a listen to The Love as well. Um, thank you so much also for joining us uh, for these uh, series of uh, Digital Leader Salon. Edward and I have been working together as a duo partnership for 10 years, so we're going to be um, all year 2020, uh, or at least the rest of the year 2020, um, we're going to be making these weekly um, digital leader salons. And um, we are really, really excited to um, to connect with our audience uh, by doing this. We also invite you to support us. Um, we really need the support at the moment because there are no concerts going on and uh, very little prospect of things getting back to normal as this is being filmed now in June 2020. Um, if you're watching this video three years later, then you don't need to send us any money. But right now, we could really do with it. So please do support us by clicking on the PayPal link below, or you can go on the other link to buy one of our CDs. And if you don't want to support us with money, you can support us by sharing this video, telling all your friends about us, and hopefully helping us uh, create some more concerts in the future. Thank you very much, Edward, for joining me again for this Digital Leader Salon. It's lovely to see you in your beautiful, very tidy place in Switzerland. <laughs> and I'm looking forward to visiting you again sometime one day. Yeah, comes to, I, I, I hope by the time you come to visit that there'll be more piles of music all over the floor and it won't be quite so tidy.